Okay, so how's it going, everyone? So today we've got Paul Turney here, and he's going to give us some top tips for running the Tour de Jantz, which he, he did a few weeks ago. So Paul's done the Tour de Jantz uh, three times now. He did it in 2017, 18, and 21. And he's come 28th, have you? No, 25th, 21st, and 12th. Uh, so the Tour de Jantz is 330K, with 24,000 meters of ascent. And for everyone out there deals in miles, that's 205 miles. So Paul has frozen on my screen here. So I'm hoping, hoping he's gonna unfreeze any second. So I can hear you. yeah, I can, I can hear you. Your face is just, hasn't changed in an expression for the past minute now. <laughs> <laughs> this is typical, isn't it? Hey, come on face. Oh, there, there we go. There we go. <laughs> you, you were just like that. <laughs> right. So, Paul, uh, so that's three times now you've ran the Tour de Jantz. Uh What's been the big differences for you between each one? Has it got any easier as you've gone along? Uh, it probably has gotten easier just knowing the route much better than I would have obviously when I, I first did it. I didn't recce any of it the first time I'd done it. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you're going in, I suppose, with a little bit of um, ignorance and, and ignorance is bliss sometimes. And it can feel, um, it can feel uh, quite difficult when um, you don't know what's coming, but also sometimes that that can be a blessing when there's a bit of the course you're not looking forward to. You know what I mean? So, um, but I find now having done it the third time, uh, mentally it's easier to get yourself ready for it. I think because you you know you know you can get around it. So it's just a case of um, improving on the little things that you may have messed up previously. So I I have made a lot of mistakes. To, every time I've done it, you know, um, right. but I've, I've reduced the amount of mistakes each time. So, um, which probably correlates with having a better finishing time than each, each time as well. Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. you, you've, you've improved about uh, around about five hours each time, haven't you? So something along those lines. Yeah. And I think there's another oh, five or six, not, I wouldn't say it'd be easy to take another five or six off it, but I think it's certainly possible. I, I, I thought I'd do sub 85 maybe this year. Um, picked up a bit of a knee injury in the summer and wasn't too hopeful about my chances after that. But uh, so I was, I was quite happy in the end to, to get around it. Um, but uh, I, I feel like sub 85 might have been there for the taking this year. And 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 now having done it again, and, and I'd like to think maybe I could go a bit quicker than that. But, you know, it's easy to say that. It's yeah. another thing to actually everything to go right and, and yeah, not, everything's um, got to come at the right time isn't it so like your fitness the weather and all sorts yeah exactly yeah i mean that's true too it, like the weather all things considered the weather was really good and and um there was a little bit of rain and a uh, bit of bit of fog and clag the last night which definitely slowed us down because we couldn't see the markers at night the cows eat the markers a lot of the times <laughs> if you're going yeah, well, if 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 you're anywhere where there are a lot of cows, and so, you know, a little bit lower down, there there obviously there's farmland, and and the the cows are out roaming, and um, the 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 flags are very easy to see in the dark because they have little um, uh, reflective bits yeah. on them, so yeah. you can see them quite a, a way off as soon as your head torch hits it. But uh, the, the last the last big climb up to Fujio Frazzati. Uh, there was just no flags because you pass through some farmland, and honestly, you could you could see about a foot in front of your face because of the clag, right. and you also didn't have any bloody markers to follow. So right. um, I was actually with uh, a guy doing the Tot Dread um, at that stage, so the, the shorter race, and he happened to have the route on his phone, and he was able to take it out and just kind of clarify where we were. Okay. Um, is, that, so that is was, the is is the path just like one defined path, or do you have different routes going off so you could have gone wrong? It, yeah, like it's like that that particular part of the route. Um, it's quite like a, a very well worn uh, path you'd have 
you know, up in the Cairngorms or down here in the lakes where people have made their own paths and there's like seven or eight paths going in different directions. Right. Yeah. Some of them, there might be three or four leading to the same place, but there's also three or four going somewhere else. And, um, you know, obviously it's not a, it's not a navigation race. So I didn't have a map and compass with me. And um, some people would argue I wouldn't be very good at <laughs> using it anyway if I did. But uh, yeah, the, the, um, that, that slowed us down a little bit. And uh, I think at times the route is obviously, it, it is very obvious. There's only one, you're on a trail in, in a woods and there's no other way to go and it's fine. But this particular area was a bit more open and um, yeah, just paths everywhere. Yeah, yeah. But eventually we found our way up to the refuge and it was it was all right. Right. Um, so, and yeah, we, that, you asked me about the weather being good, didn't you? And I rambled. Yeah, no, um, that's all right. Feel free, ramble away on anything you want. So what, what's the big draw? Why, why do you keep going back to Tour de Jones? Um, well, I, I just, each time I've done it, I've had a, I feel uh, like I've enjoyed it. Oh, you know, all things considered, I've definitely not enjoyed plenty of bits of it and when you're not feeling great it's um yeah. it's a bit miserable but but in general you you come away from it feeling like it was a really um brilliant experience and uh the you know the italians particularly in the Asta valley just love the event and and um so there's a lot of local support and there's a lot of people volunteer for the race and so um just the atmosphere when you're out there even you know at six o'clock in the morning there's there's people around and um you know banging on cowbells and stuff like that so yeah yeah uh i've enjoyed that side of things each time i've done it and then i suppose i felt like i could do a bit better and and there's that competitive side that you know you'd like to to do the time you think you're capable of doing you know and i still yeah. feel like i could do slightly better so do you feel as if you're, you're almost there now you, you can yeah, well, still... cl- closer yeah but uh yeah. Like, I, I mean, I could be way off, you know, um, it could be just ego saying, yeah, I can definitely do, you know, 80 hours or whatever. But um, I feel like if I've learned lessons each time, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and um, some of those lessons that, you know, I put into action and, and it worked this time. And then a few I maybe could have um, done a bit better. So uh, I still feel like there's time there to be taken away. Right. It's not as if each year you're getting a year older that's going to make a big difference because the the other guys are, are younger it, it, on that yeah. race of that length is age a massive thing or not so much yeah i mean it, it generally tends to be guys older than me that that do really well with there's obviously exceptions to that you know galen reynolds has done amazingly each time he's done it and i think he's a few years younger than me uh yeah, I'm pretty sure he's a few years younger. Um, but like Franco Colle, who's won it a few times, um, uh, Oliveri Bassatelli, who's won it tr- twice at least, and he's been in the top five a few times. Like he's in his fifties now, as far as I know, um, mm. and he's just immensely strong and, and age. I'm I'm not at his level, obviously, but but age isn't a barrier to him in in that race. It seems, yeah. um, and I think like yeah, it's you're not having to move really really fast so it kind of suits uh people probably slightly older um to, right. to a certain extent. okay so um, there's still hope yeah. for for all of us out there oh yeah geez um you know i i think uh you could be improving at that race the whole way through your 40s you know right. um, yeah yeah, yeah. Doing it more okay speed. well so, down to specifics of the race so like what can you explain what life bases are and how they're different to normal checkpoints yeah um so the life so so the route the route is actually roughly i think it's closer to 350k right so that gives you um roughly speaking uh 750k sections there's a few or there's one section that's a bit shorter than that but uh roughly it's seven sections of the race and every 50k or so there's a what they call a life base and it's usually in a bigger town right in a sports hall or a you know community center or something like that where the facilities are better and there's there's more room and, and everything else so um they sort of uh 
there's there's more variety of food and there's more beds to sleep in and and all that so they it's it's just an easy way of breaking up the the race and then um there's other checkpoints then are usually in in refuges uh, a little bit higher up in the hills okay. occasionally they're in small uh villages as well lower down but generally speaking they're they're up in the hills and um they they would have you don't have access to your support crew if you happen to have someone supporting you you right. wouldn't have access to them at refuges but you would have access to them at some of the at okay. all of the life bases yeah, yeah so you can put a uh what's it called a they give you a bag at the start of the race you can put all your spare kit that you might need during the race in yeah. and that uh, gets transported to each life base as you go along so even if you didn't have someone supporting you 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 could still get access to this bag right okay so you, you don't have to pick i want it at this particular base they'll take it to each one every time you leave a base you put right. the bag back with them and then they, they okay, well, that's good. It at least you don't have to make decisions beforehand as to what you think you're going to need at mile goodness knows what yeah absolutely yeah, it's, it's very useful because um obviously the weather over the course of three or four days can change a lot yeah and what you need on the sunday when you start might be very different to the wednesday yeah, uh, yeah. when it's pissing it down you know so yeah so sleep yeah. how how much did you sleep and has that changed over the years when you've done it over the three attempts yeah i mean like the the sleep thing is probably responsible for taking um a good chunk of time off what i've done because uh the first year i did the race i think uh i can't remember exactly how much i slept but i had much longer stops yeah and um, particularly in the first half of the race because basically i messed up the first day went a little bit too hard didn't probably eat the right things uh it was very very hot i had went to a bloody hairdresser a few days beforehand in Chamonix actually and asked for a you know I normally get a head shave yeah. but not too short and anyway that it was lost in translation and she bloody you know <laughs> she had you. made me bald basically. yeah and uh um I started the race with not very much hair on my head and forgot to wear a hat and it was really hot ah. the first day way too much sun and yeah yeah just was knackered in the the second 50k of the race and um it's, so because of that to, to try and recover from that and make sure i got to the finish i i had a few big or longer stops at say the second and third life bases and that right. that lost me a fair bit of time but uh after i'd gotten through that bad patch then i felt pretty okay you know yeah um so so i can't remember exactly how much sleep i had that first year I had a little bit less the second year, I think. And then this year, uh, I reckon probably two or two and a half hours over the course of the race, maybe. Right, um, okay. So that's what, a little snippet, so like 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there? or Yeah, I tried, tried to break it into 20 or 30 minute right. uh, uh, bits, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, so Sometimes I lay down and couldn't sleep. And um, yeah. like say the third life base in Donas, which is 150K in, uh, it's the lowest point on the route so it's it's a 300 meters above sea level it's really low compared to most of the other places yeah so it's much much warmer down there it was really really humid and um i i don't know i just overheated on that section to get there and uh felt rubbish when i got there and needed i lay down there i think for probably half an hour but didn't sleep i was just trying to you know recover i got under a cold shower to try and cool down and just yes. yeah i was really uh feeling really bad there but then once it, it got dark and it cooled down a bit i was started to come around again so okay but you, you can only have a sleep in the life bases you can't in the refuges that was the rule this year normally you can sleep in any refuge that has beds okay or uh, any life base but this year because of covid i think they were trying to minimize the amount of time you spent at the refuges yeah um and uh they had this rule as well this year where you had to have a sleeping bag in your drop bag yeah. because they didn't want to be providing blankets that two different people would use yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, but in the end, it, it sort of was left up to the you know the local team that were managing the checkpoint. So um, some of the refuges allowed you to sleep there and others didn't, and that was kind of the way it went. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, 
So norm, under normal circumstances, you are usually allowed to sleep in those refuges. Okay, okay. And how about food? What sort of, did you have it in your head beforehand, I'm going to eat such and such, take something with you, and you just didn't eat it, or did could you just eat whatever you wanted? Um, so the, I had bit, a bit more of a plan this year than I have previously. Um, yeah. I decided to to try and go with, so for the first day, you know, you're moving a bit quicker and decided to go with gels for the most part and a, and a little bit of uh, solid food as well, like, you know, different bars, energy bars, stuff like yeah, that, yeah. Um, and, and keep the real food to a minimum for the the first 50K section, only because I think I've eaten too much real food in that first section previously, and it's maybe not digested as easily. Uh, okay. Um, and because you're moving a bit quicker, you know, it, it just caught up with me. So with the gels, I knew exactly how much carbohydrate I was getting in per hour, well, yeah. roughly. Uh, and that seemed to work pretty well the first day. Um, and I was always, you know, considering that I'd probably get sick of them and, and move on to eating a bit more solid food. And that's kind of the way it worked. So, uh, you know, that particular section where I got too hot on this on day two, mm-hmm. um, couldn't really stomach gels or any any food really for, for a few hours and uh once that passed i sort of i could eat anything like i was really hungry and i right. basically whatever someone put in front of me i'd have probably eaten but right. um and what, what were you able to eat was it like sandwiches or salami or soup yeah so at, at the checkpoints generally speaking there was either a broth with pasta in it okay or okay. or pasta with um tomato sauce um they would usually give you a little bit of uh, parmesan cheese on top of that and, and maybe a little bit of dried meat um or cheese as well so that type of stuff was what i kind of survived on for the, certainly the second half of the race and with the odd bit of um uh chocolate and stuff like you know mars bars or, or yeah, yeah. Uh, usually bars or stuff like that as well um but uh yeah w- once i suppose once i came round and and wasn't feeling rubbish uh i i had a bit of a deficit from not eating and yeah it was like putting stuff into a bottomless pit you know like it, i could have eaten anything really at right that well that's good at least yeah. you were able to take food on board and that was refueling you yeah 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 um like i it's something that i've messed up a fair bit in in previous races and chatting to robbie Britton this year he he put a massive emphasis on that right rightly so uh and it just kind of woke me up a bit to what you know how badly i was doing it or or, or how much i could improve it you know and it, and it's sort of he sort of drilled it into to me certainly this year about needing um to to, to up what i was taking because i you know went away and looked at what i was generally eating yeah in in different places and it, it probably wasn't enough because uh you know, I'm probably heavier than a lot of people doing these races. I probably do need a bit more than, yeah, than yeah. a lot of people. So is he saying. saying eat every specific time, every half an hour, or was it more of a make sure you have X amount of calories? Uh, well, he he would, the way we were doing it was looking at the amount of carbohydrate I was taking in. So rather than bothering about calories, I mean, there's correlation there anyway, but yeah. Um, you know, if most gels will have 20 or 25 grams of carbs, maybe 30 grams of carbs sometimes. Yeah. Um, so if it's a quicker race and you're using gels, it's very easy then to uh, work out, well, first of all, work out how much you want to take and then work out how much you need. But I um, I played around a bit with, you know, the, the intervals of when I would eat. So um, I, I did a race earlier in the, the year, earlier in the summer, I mean, where... I think it was about a six hour race. So I was, that was the first race this year. I had a chance to kind of put some of this into practice and yeah, I was very um, specific that time. Every 25 minutes I would take something Yeah, uh, and I had a, you know, a, an alarm set in my watch to remind me. And um, like, I still probably could have eaten more that particular race, but it was, it was an improvement on what I had been doing. So right, um, yeah. with, with Tor, I wasn't as kind of strict because it's much much longer and um eventually you're moving much much slower so you don't probably need as much uh um you don't need to be as um 
I suppose, worried about it because you're because the intensity is lower. You're not burning that much glycogen or as much glycogen. You know? Okay. Yeah. And support yeah. crews. So you had Sarah along as your support crew. Did you have anyone else? And how did how did that work? Was she able to get to all of the the points easy enough? Yes. So I wouldn't say it was easy for her. She was. She told me afterwards how uh, you know inconvenienced she was. <laughs> <laughs> like, does she have Just to so rely on public transport to get from one life base to another, or did she have a car? Or? Uh, yeah. So we. I drove over. Um, right. It was at, myself and Ali actually drove over. Ali came with me when I was uh, driving over a few weeks before the race, and um, Sarah was already out there. So normally. We, we sold our camper van there um, like a couple of months ago. So we were hoping to have another one in time to to go out in that. And then Sarah would have had that to go around to each different point. Yeah. But in the end, it wasn't ready. And um, she, so she had accommodation at in Morgier, which is about 10K down the valley from Cormier. And so she would have to drive from there to each different uh, checkpoint and come back again. So that put a lot more strain on her because it was it's just a lot more driving involved yeah um uh and like so she was at every yeah she was at each life base um and on and what that means basically is that she can go to a designated area again this was because of covid you weren't allowed into the actual life base she would she would have to go to a separate kind of tent mm -hmm. um i could go in there then and she could help me with you know changing kid or Right. whatever i needed for the next section she it was just she's obviously a bit more um coherent uh, than me maybe after three days yeah uh but that that was really useful and um it was just her she, so a friend of ours was also doing tot dread so he was starting tot dread on the tuesday we started on the the sunday before that so he was with her for the first couple of checkpoints um before his race started and then she was on her. She met. She met up with Robbie as well. Robbie Britton. He was helping uh, Ali. So, she, yeah, she was. She was meeting up with other people. But Jenner, she was my support. If you like, she was the one who came into the the checkpoints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, does 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 everyone have a, a support crew, or do people do it with no support? Yeah, plenty of people do without support and it's i think yeah of course it's a, it's a disadvantage um you can definitely do the race without support obviously because people do yeah uh but I, I think it's very useful to to have someone just to it probably just increases how quickly you can get in and out of checkpoints you know you've got a helping hand basically when sure. you're not moving very quickly thinking yeah. very quickly so uh i supported nikki spinks in 2019 and um you know, so I got to see it from the other side of the fence, if you like. And I, I just, I first of all, I really enjoyed it. I thought I wouldn't enjoy it because it's stressful, and you're, you know, you're, yeah. um, you're not getting the the enjoyment of actually doing the race, and you're you're sort of running around like a um, headless chicken. Like, but in the end, it was really, really enjoyable, and it was nice to see uh, from the other side. Um, and I just from seeing the other side, I think yeah, it's it's obvious that. It's helpful to have someone yeah, yeah. minding you basically in those life spaces. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So yeah. what sort of advice would you give to someone running Tour de Jones for the first time? Would it be kind of like general ultra running advice of don't head off too quick, or is it gonna be more specific to, to the course itself? Uh so there's there's definitely a few things that would be useful to do. Uh, it might not be possible for everyone to do it, but it would yeah. definitely be useful. And and one of those being, if you live somewhere like over here, uh, then it's it's pretty useful to get out there earlier and get used to the altitude because um, if you're coming from sea level and you arrive two days before the race, you're not going to be acclimatized and it's, it's going to make it difficult when you start to hit those higher uh, points on the course and... What you know, sort of height asked, does it start at? Then? So, well, it starts at twelve hundred meters, so it's it's not mega mega high, but um, it goes up to three thousand three hundred is the highest point. Okay. And although that's not it's not insanely high or anything, it's definitely 
has an effect on someone who lives at sea level and yeah. um, makes it uh, pretty difficult. Uh, so, I, like, I got out, me and Ali arrived two and, a, two and a half weeks maybe before the race, and that was seems like it was just about enough to to get over the worst of that um, feeling. Uh, like, certainly the first few runs we went on, you just you notice it's just a bit more difficult going uphill. Yeah, um, it was just the air a bit thinner. Yeah, yeah, just you, you're not able to move at the same pace yeah, yeah. you think you should for the same effort, you know. Um, so that's one thing if I know that's almost impossible for most people with, with work, uh, but it's worth considering. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is, like you said, yeah, starting off very conservatively is a good idea. I, th- I think no matter who you are, I just think um, if it's the first time you're doing it, you need to be able to get to halfway feeling like you're not totally broken. Yeah. Um, and you almost want to treat the first half of the race like it isn't a race. You're you're on a uh, you're on a hiking trip or something like that, where yeah. you're not thinking about the finish line or, or trying to be quicker than someone else. You're just you're obviously wanting to be um, efficient going through checkpoints and not waste time. But equally, you want to take the pressure off yourself and not feel like you should be um, going hard. And and honestly, the the benefit of that is when you do get to halfway or, or two thirds in, you're starting to pass people who won't have started like that. Yeah. And that's a real mental boost, isn't it? To be, to be passing people yeah, um, sure. rather than being passed. Uh, I think um, no. if you can't, this is another one that maybe you can't do, but it will be beneficial to get on some very long climbs, obviously, because uh, the climbs are very long over there. Now, again, it's difficult in this country yeah. because we don't have, hills that are high enough scotland is definitely better than uh you know wales or england but you, you just want um, sort of like eight hour hikes up in the hills basically to just get yourself used to it i i think um certainly coming closer to the race that three or four months before two or three months even before the race to be starting to think that way yeah to um long days out in the hills but not necessarily long runs you know yeah. think, take a different mindset to it and, and maybe think about yeah long hikes with some with some running involved as well but you're going to be walking everything uphill if if you want to um get around it so yeah, yeah. uh just getting used to that and and understanding that you don't need to run all no, these hills no, no. and i'm assuming you use poles yeah uh i don't think i saw anyone who didn't use them right um that race i the very first year actually the race was run a, a guy called um ulrich gross won the race and i think he didn't use polls and mm-hmm. other than that um i haven't seen anyone do well at it and not be using them to, from from my memory anyway um it's just something you do in in that race it's it's yeah. beneficial obviously it's, and again that would be anyone out there just make sure you get used to using poles beforehand as well don't just take them for the first time <laughs> yeah like i um in previous years i've done a fair bit of training with them uh much less this year just because i was i was doing um <laughs> the dog was pulling on my sleeve here so <laughs> uh, for everyone out there paul's got his dog <laughs> next to him who keeps jumping on him there's two of them here beside me, but uh, <laughs> one of them a bit rambunctious. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I use them less this year because I was training for more runnable stuff, you know, up until the middle of summer. Yeah. Um, and I, I probably didn't need to do use them as much because I had used them quite a bit in previous years. Yeah. Uh, but even just doing a little bit more with them for the last month before the race was was useful, you know. Um, and when you use them, are you using them up, up and down and flat? Or have you got a preference to, to what works for you? I think uh, in training, probably mostly just uphill. Um, right. But during the race, I did use them downhill as well. I just think uh, I got, I've gotten used to doing that and it's, it takes a bit of pressure off your legs when you're descending. It just gives you, when you're very tired as well, it gives you a little bit of extra balance. Yeah. It's um, earlier in the race, I maybe put them away when I was descending, but yeah, from from kind of halfway on, I was probably using them. Any help the you can get? Oh yeah, geez, like it. 
it's the type of thing that if you get you if you, if you do it enough you, you kind of see the benefit but i've seen where people say oh no i just can't get used to using them downhill or i can't get used to using them at all and like i i really think that that's i mean it's similar to saying oh i, I can't eat when i race like you know i just i'm just someone who can't do it you're not just someone who can't do it you're someone who refuses to do it and you haven't actually given it a, a proper yeah you just have to get used to it yeah 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 exactly yeah so kit wise what what sort of uh, kit were you using what sort of shoes uh, did you have on and over the three times that you've done it have you thought one particular type of shoes worked better for that event than than others yeah so this year i used the uh the innovate terra ultra 270 okay which is their um, uh i suppose zero drop the last graphemes. Yeah, and it's and it's got a nice a nice amount of cushioning without having too much. Um, it's the type of shoe that I like wearing, you know, on any type of surface. I think it's really comfortable. It's nice and wide. Um, it feels nice even on the road. There's not too much grip where you know you feel the studs coming through on the road. Yeah. Um, so it's very much an all round shoe in my opinion. And then uh, they've, I suppose, three years ago I used the old version of that shoe. They've they've since come out with a newer version, which right. is an improvement. Okay. That'd be the 260 then. Yeah, I can't remember the numbers, but yeah, the the, the newer one anyway. Yeah. Um, and so that that that's been my favorite shoe ever that they've made. Um, okay. And it's it's the one I used. I had I just alternated between two different pairs during the race just to to you know change things up really more than anything else. Um, but the first year I did the race, I used a pair of Cross Talon uh, shoes. So more like a fell shoe the studs are quite big right um, okay. definitely not, yeah definitely not the ideal shoe for that race right but at the time it was my favorite innovate shoe and i i knew i could um i knew i knew it suited me foot and, and the shape of the shoe was really nice and i was willing to kind of put up with the fact that maybe there was a bit too much grip for the type of terrain um but having used the terra ultra now i, I can't even imagine how i thought about using the, the cross talent it's just right. not the right shoe for the, the and you, did you you said you took two pairs did you so did you take a different size at all or were they both the same size the, the, the yeah i, I kind of alternated i had um, a slightly bigger fit uh which i i started in the, the normal size then after about halfway i went into the bigger pair and for the very last section i just changed back into the other pair because um, it had been really wet previously, and I just wanted a dry pair of no, okay. uh, shoes for the last section. Yeah, so yeah, um, yeah it's it, I couldn't complain. I know I would say that, but um, I it it's a good shoe for that route because it's there's there's very little actual muddy, you know, really soft, slippy conditions. There's a little bit, but very little, um, and it it just grips well on 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 rock and on alpine kind of trails i think it's the idea okay shoe perfect and yeah. any of the races you you've ran does anything else compare to tour de Jans or is that just totally unique yeah i mean like i suppose you know other people have done a lot more stuff than me and they might say well uh there are other races that compare to it or you know but in my opinion yeah there's it's it's the only uh, alpine race i've done of that distance and and just given where it is as well and the the absolute um love of mountain running in that area uh, i think it does make it uh unique i suppose um you know people could make an argument for the swiss peaks now that it's they've yeah. got a very similar race although that's a linear like a point to point one so that it'll yeah. have a slightly different feel probably um but I, I, it's why I keep coming back. I just think it's, uh, it's it's my favourite race of of all uh, okay. races, with the possible exception of a few fellow races I can think of. But they're obviously completely different. Slightly different, um, yeah. Slightly so, different. will you go back for a fourth time, or would you consider the the Tour Four Fifty, so like the the bigger one, or is that just different? Yeah. Is that for a different person? I, it's it's definitely a very very different event like it's you know there's there's less 
people obviously doing it. There's, I think there was only 60 this year, but I think it's capped at 100 normally. Um, I think it would have filled up and you would have had 100 if COVID hadn't added to the kind of uncertainty. Uh, but even then it would have been, it would have felt very, very, like a very, very different event. You know, you're, you're on your own most of the time. Um, there's no, that they, they do go to some of the, the life bases, but they go to uh, quieter refuges that we don't go to. So therefore, obviously there'll be no tar runners there and that'll make it quieter as well. Yeah. Um, but I think in terms of the distance, it's only, I say only, it's it's 100k longer, which isn't, in the grand scheme of things, it's not ridiculously different. Um, yeah. I think the terrain is a little bit sketchier in places and um, it would probably benefit you to to be confident on steep ground and yeah, you know yeah. via Ferrada maybe and, and stuff like that. But uh, and and of course it's not marked either. Well, the bits that don't intersect with the tar route. Okay, so you've um, got to navigate. Uh, yeah, no, it. I think everyone does it off a of GPS, but right. Um, and they, yeah, they give you the the GPS. So I don't think anyone has too many problems with the nav side of it. Right. Um, but I I I do fancy having a go at it i suppose because it's not seen as the race over there like tor is the main race and then this is like a uh i don't know it's 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 not the main event yeah yeah um yeah. and so you kind of me and ali were talking about this you kind of think well i could just go do that route on my own i could do a hiking holiday or something like that and and uh do it and save my thousand quid or whatever it costs yeah. to enter it uh but then on the other hand i think oh well you know, I've done the tour a few times. It'd be nice to do something different. And, and you know, I know some people who've done it and they, they loved it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of torn a bit, you know, between the two. Yeah. So you've not really made your mind up if you're going to go back and do either or either? I I feel like I'll do, I will go back, you know, whether it's to do one or the other, but I haven't made up my mind about whether it'll be next year or what I'm doing yeah, yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, yeah few ideas of stuff i'd really like to do and um i i'm indecisive at the best of times so i haven't <laughs> made up my mind. you need sarah to make your mind up for you yeah well she, it's it's good that i have her and and other people sensible people like her to to kind of warm me off i was going to go and uh, do a there's a race in ireland not not this weekend next the following weekend um along the Wicklow Way, which is about 130k or 127k or something. Right. And, you know, after tour, I was, I was feeling all right. And I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'm feeling good. And it's a race I've wanted to do for a while. And anyway, Sarah said, you idiot, you know, don't, don't do that. You have to, you haven't had enough time to recover. And sort of as the couple of weeks have passed now, I kind of realized that, yeah, that's, that's the case and I'm not going to do it. So it's useful having Sarah to, yeah, to advise me sometimes, yeah, yeah. along with other people as well. Excellent. Okay, well, that's that, that's about all the questions that I've got for you. We need to see the dogs, though. So uh, let's let's check out the reason why you've been jumping up and down. I'll grab one of them here. Once I... <laughs> Excellent. That's. Uh, Doesn't look one. impressed. <laughs> I'll put it back down. I'll get rid of it. So let's see if you can tell them apart. Oh, yeah, no, they are slightly different. Different face. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of them, this one's got more uh, spots on her face. The other one has a big white line and a right. uh, different color eye. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, perfect. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for answering the questions. And hopefully right. somebody out there will find this super interesting and make them have a a good race at the tour for themselves. So thanks everyone yeah. for watching. Uh, thanks to Paul. Uh, thanks for me. And we'll see you next time.